What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to the Neighborhood Podcast. One of the hosts of the podcast. My name is Kyle Dabra. What's going on, everybody? Kevin Valentin here, other half of the podcast. Kyle, what we got going on this evening, bro? Bro, I'm going to try to hold it down as best as I can with these allergies, man. I've been fighting it all day, but bro, we here. I'm just going to power through it and just hope for the best. Hopefully, I don't have one of my uh, situations where I start like coughing or start sneezing, and I'm just an absolute wreck. I remember the one time when we were recording and I had COVID and I had like that one little spell like where I couldn't stop coughing. For like the final but, like six minutes of the episode. It, it, like, I thought it was I th- thought it was you thought I was dying there for a second, you know. It could happen again. I'm just saying, like, you know, definitely be on the lookout for it. But all, all in all, I'll be I'll be fine. Hopefully we get through this straight. unscathed. But we do got some topics to go over. It's mostly going to be NBA conversations for today's episode. We're going to try to keep it relatively short. You ready to go over these topics, though? Hell yeah. All right, so we're going to start in the Western Conference. We're going to talk a little bit about the Suns. We're going to talk about the injury that Chris Paul sustained during the All-Star break. Broke his thumb. He will be out for the next six to eight weeks. We'll talk about how significant his absence will be for Phoenix moving forward. After that, We're going to transition to the Eastern Conference. We're going to talk a little bit about James Harden and his debut for Philly. It is expected that he is going to start his Philly career on Friday night for the 76ers. So that'll definitely be interesting. We'll talk just about how his impact for the 76ers will be moving forward. Hasn't really been the best case scenario on the last couple teams that he's been on. It's kind of been up and down to say the least. And then after that, what we're going to do is... We're going to focus on each conference and we're going to focus in on which team do we think at this current moment in time has the capabilities of not only making a huge playoff run in April, May, and June, but a team that can go all the way to the finals this year from each conference. So we'll start with the Eastern Conference. We'll pick a team and then we'll transition to the Western Conference and we'll pick a team based on what we think or which team will represent that conference when it's all said and done going into the finals. So that's pretty much the agenda that we have for today's episode. So it'll be short and concise, but let's not waste any more time. Let's dive into this first topic. And that is going to be Chris Paul. So during the all-star break, I believe it was before the uh, NBA 75th ceremony. I think that was kind of like what happened or the time that it occurred. Uh, Chris Paul sustained a broken thumb. Now, The timetable for his recovery is in between six to eight weeks. So depending on how long he rehabs it, the Suns could just potentially hold him out until the playoffs. Or maybe they may give him a little bit more burn towards the end of the season just so he can get up into a little bit of game shape by the time the playoffs roll around. All in all, though, Phoenix is sitting in the driver's seat in the Western Conference. They have the best record, not only in the Western Conference, but they have the best record overall in the NBA, and they've really lived up to expectations after falling short against the Bucks in the NBA Finals last year. So the teams, the, the team as a whole, they're playing phenomenal. But what we're going to focus on is the absence of Chris Paul. Now, Kevin, to kick this one to you, with Chris Paul being out for the next six to eight weeks, just how significant do you think his absence will be for the Suns moving forward? I think it's going to be critical for them. Not that they're not going to be able to hold their playoff stature uh, until he gets back. I think that they're going to fall down eight spots and kind of have to go into the play-in tournament. But I think they will have a significant drop-off, and here's why. So Chris Paul, we all know, floor general. Chris Paul obviously distributes the ball significantly and obviously very, very efficiently. They call him a point god for a reason. A lot of games he has one, if not no, turnovers. He can give you 15 points. He can give you 10 assists. Obviously, can play great defense on your guard. And just overall be that extended coach on the floor. So when you take that piece out and you have to rely upon campaign to come into the starting lineup and lead on a consistent basis, I don't necessarily know how that's going to work out because, of course, Cameron Payne has been the spark off of the bench, has been someone that has been able to score and distribute the basketball in short amount of time periods when Chris Paul steps off the floor. So I know what you're thinking. Well, they still have Devin Booker. Devin Booker is not really known for being a facilitator. Not that he can't pass, and I'm not saying that he can't handle the load as, as, a, as an individual himself, but they work best when Chris has the ball in his hands, puts Devin in good spots, sets Jay Crowder up in the corner for threes, runs the pick and roll with DeAndre Ayton. 
I don't necessarily know if Devin Booker is going to have that effect or be able to sustain that level of play while at the same time putting in his consistent points per game because he's averaging 25 and a half points. So if he has to put up more shots or if he has to put up less shots to distribute the basketball to get other people the ball, we don't know how that's going to go. And I'm looking at this roster up and down and I'm saying, well, Alfred Payton has to step up. I don't necessarily know if Alfred Payton should technically be on an NBA roster, but that's another conversation for another day. So when you look at guard depth, it's genuinely Devin, Chris, Payne, and Payton. Chris Paul is going to be out, so someone's got to be able to step up, and, uh, step up and distribute the ball. I know that they also have Aaron Gordon, but Aaron, excuse me, Aaron Holiday, but Aaron Holiday is only averaging six points per game, not really getting too much burn. So it's like, what are that's where I get concerned is the depth of the Suns point guard position or the you know the, the true one. So I think that they'll fall two three spots. Uh, I think that Golden State will end up surpassing them because they're just starting to get into a rhythm. They're getting healthy. Um, I, I think that the addition to Bismack Biombo or excuse me the addition of Bismack Biombo down low to really give Aiton a break and give them some depth at the big position will give them an opportunity to really focus in on getting those big men the ball and creating mismatch opportunities for their team as well. But overall, I think Phoenix is still a great team. I think as they get healthy towards the playoffs, they're going to make a big run. But overall, Chris Paul's significant absence is going to be uh, pretty big for the Suns moving forward. Hey, Kevin, I'm going to take the opposite on this one. I'm not too concerned about the Suns, and here's why. So essentially the way that I see it, actually, I pulled up, their first game after the All-Star break. They were playing the Thunder Thursday night. And they beat the Thunder by 20 points. Pretty typical. The Thunder aren't that good of a team. But the one thing that kind of stood out, and it's kind of the point to go opposite of what you said, Devin Booker dropped 25 points. But he had 12 assists. So he kind of took that responsibility of what Chris Paul had as far as his facilitator role is. And I thought he did it actually pretty well in the first game that the Suns didn't have Chris Paul at their disposal. So now to focus on Chris Paul, it's going to be a significant blow for them moving forward for the next month and a half, potentially two months. But do I think it's going to really impact their stature in the Western Conference? Not too much. I think what they'll try to do is they'll try to cover up that hole with possibly one or two other players. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see guys like Cam Johnson step up Cameron Payne step up. Now we have seen those players in specific moments in the past and throughout this season. They played spectacular in moments. And to kind of give you an idea of like Cam Johnson getting some burn in that game against the Oklahoma City Thunder, I'm just going to pull up my phone real quick. He played 31 minutes. He scored 21 points. He had four rebounds and five assists. Not too bad. I mean, the guy's been playing consistent all year. I thought he was a huge factor for the Suns and their playoff run last year. So if you see guys stepping up in that way, where you see these role players, when they're given the opportunities to go out there and perform to the best of their abilities, these guys are being able to do that at such a high level. It shows me that these guys have confidence. When you have a coach like Monty Williams to back them up, to give them the best chances to win from a strategy, uh, from a strategic standpoint, I think it's in their favor to do pretty well despite not having Chris Paul in the lineup. Now, I will agree with you. I don't think that their top spot in the Western Conference is going to last. I think eventually what's going to happen is they are going to slip from that top spot. But do I think that they're going to fall off that much? No, not necessarily. I think they'll probably fall maybe a spot or two just because, you know, you have to take into account Chris Paul is a huge factor for that team. Granted, he's not the biggest like point scorer, but just the way that he's able to facilitate the ball, you have to be able to respect that. But all in all, this is a relatively young team, and I think that their youth can definitely carry them to a good position in the Western Conference playoffs. I think the one thing that I'm going to look for is whether or not that Devin is really going to take over in certain situations of the game. We always know that he could score at any time, but I think now... You're going to see him take a little bit more responsibility, carry that on his shoulders. And I think with that said, I think the Suns are going to be all right. I'm not too worried about them, you know, falling off a cliff because Chris Paul is not going to be there. I think they're in good hands. They have a great coach at their disposal. And I think all in all, you know, the Suns are going to be a dangerous team in the Western Conference playoffs. 
and they have all the pieces to possibly make another finals run this year. I could definitely see that. So, I mean, like, obviously, you know, people are going to be able to step up. And I didn't say that, like, I, you know, just to clarify, I'm not saying Devin can't distribute the basketball on oh, no. a oh, consistent no. basis. Oh, no. But what I'm saying is I don't necessarily know if he's going to be able to do that for two months. You know, eventually uh-huh. it is going to, you know, start to cross an issue. And, I mean, if campaign can give – five, six, seven assists, Devin can give five, six assists here and there, you know, they might be able to compensate, but you know, the overall presence of Chris Paul on the court and what it is he brings as an individual is going to be missing overall for the next couple of weeks. But again, I'm not saying they're going to drop to the fifth, sixth seed. I just think they, they drop third, maybe fourth, come, depending on if people are able to capitalize. Golden State's a couple games behind. Obviously you have a couple of other teams literally sitting right there within a couple games of each other. I'm looking at the standings right now. Memphis is right behind Golden State by a game. Obviously, Golden State is behind by, I believe, five games. So in a two-month span, that is an easy flip within just two teams in and of themselves. So I'm just saying I think it's a little bit more possible than what people are going to believe. And don't be sleeping on your boy Cam Johnson either. Boys from UNC, he's been cooking. Hey, 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 just saying. hey, hey, I show my boys love on and off stream. Don't play with me like that. Just saying. I mean, he, he dropped 20 don't, points don't, tonight, bro. Don't, don't don't start something you don't want to get into. Bro, he's putting in work against the Thunder. Granted, it is the Thunder. He's putting I was a little about to say it's the Thunder, but I'm not going to take away 20 points from my dog like that because he's a bucket. He's nice behind the three-point line, bro. He's bucket. Nice. He was the best shooter in the draft. His career shooting percentage at fucking UNC behind the arc was like over 40%. Disgusting. And it's carried over, so. Bucket. He's doing a, doing a great job. So. Bucket. But now we get to focus uh, on your favorite player, Kevin. Do we have player. to? Like, do we yeah. really have to do this? Yes, we do, unfortunately. Yeah, so we got to talk a little bit about James Harden. So as it's reported by Shams, it looks like James Harden is going to get his debut start with the 76ers on Friday night. Now, this has been in the works for the last couple days or so. Granted, the trade went down before the All-Star break, and it was probably one of the biggest blockbuster deals that we've seen in recent memory. You had Ben Simmons go from the 76ers to the Nets. You have James Harden go over to the Sixers and really kind of set social media on fire when that trade actually took place. And really the main question is now, which team is going to win the trade in the long run? Is it going to be the Nets just because of Ben Simmons' defensive presence? Or is it going to be the 76ers now that they add one of the top scores and one of the best shooters that the NBA has to offer with James Harden? And we're going to find out within the foreseeable future to see which team is going to win that trade in the long run. Now, Kevin, to kick this one to you, what do you think James Harden's impact is going to be for the 76ers now that he's getting his debut start Friday night for Philly? I have to do my literal best to keep myself in check and be unbiased. So I'm going to look at this objectively. James Harden is going to provide something that Ben Simmons could never, a jump shot. James Harden is going to provide something that uh, Ben Simmons also could not, consistent distribution of the basketball. However, James is nowhere near going to be able to defend like Ben was. James is nowhere near going to be able to pass up shots to give up to other players like Ben was. Ben didn't shoot, but he also was able to find people that were open because he had Supreme Court vision. So it's a little bit of a pro and con kind of thing. The reason, similar to what we talked about yesterday in our segment about who's going to win the MVP, the reason I have an issue with James Harden going to Philadelphia is because They do best when they play through Joel Embiid. They do best when Joel has his back to the basket, he's posting players up, getting people into foul trouble, and then when they collapse in the paint, they kick out to their shooters, or even, you know, Joel can hit a couple of threes and some mid-range jump shots as well. When James Harden's on a team, that takes everything away. It runs through James. James will either pass or he he will shoot. And James will shoot probably, I want to say, seven out of ten times and absorb a good 12 to 15 seconds of the shot clock with isolation basketball in between the legs, step back after step back, not getting called for a travel. 
And it's going to get redundant. I don't necessarily know if that's going to be able to mesh with what Doc Rivers is doing there in Philadelphia. I don't know how that's going to bode well for his cohorts with Matisse Theibel, Danny Green, and of course, Tobias Harris, which, which Kyle and I were talking about earlier tonight when we were trying to figure out how that's going to affect him. Tobias didn't sign a max contract to go out there and play third, fourth fiddle when James Harden is literally technically the first and second option, which is going to piss off Joel Embiid eventually, especially late in game. They're going to want to fight for who's going to take that last shot, which has also been the issue with James the last four to five years. He didn't want the ball in Chris's hands. He didn't want the ball in Russell's hands. Didn't want the ball in KD's hands. It's just now you're going to a team in which this man is the team. Joel Embiid is 100% the the life and heartbeat of the Philadelphia 76ers. And if you're not giving him the ball, he's going to lose his shot attempts. He's going to drop down in points per game. He's going to lose points efficiency and all of these other things. But can James Harden revert back to when he was playing the point guard earlier in Mike D'Antoni's system to where he was actually averaging a couple double-doubles, a couple triple-doubles here and there in Houston his final couple years? Maybe. Will he be able to put up 25 and 10? Maybe. I just genuinely don't feel in my heart of hearts, and this is where the bias is going to come in, that a diva and a self-centered and selfish player like James Harden is going to be able to divert shot attempts and take away from his production and, of course, his incentives uh, to give Joel and beat the basketball. I just genuinely don't have faith in him to be selfless and put the team first. And if you're taking shots away from your best player – and your second best player, or should I say now third best player in Tobias Harris, you're going to ruin the chemistry of the team. I mean, for God's sakes, James Harden puts up, what, 20 to 22 shots a game? That's unheard of for someone that's going to a team that he's not the first option. So I don't know how it's going to work. I don't think it's going to work well. And I think that this trade is going to actually blow up in Philly's face. Kevin, I'm very conflicted on this one, but I have to be honest. When I look at recent memory, Wherever James has gone, it hasn't ended well. You look at Houston. Look at the exit that he had. I thought that was probably one of the most pettiest exits I've ever seen from an NBA player in recent memory. Same thing in Brooklyn. Brooklyn was pretty much ready to get rid of him after he was starting to stir up drama between the whole Kyrie Irving situation. I believe James was getting mad about the fact that KD wasn't on the court that often and just It wasn't a good fit for him moving forward. And when I look at the situation in Philly, history has a little bit of a bias for me in this one. Bro, I think he's going to crash and burn in Philly. And that's just my honest opinion. So the reason why I say that is because look at those situations that he's been in in previous uh, stints with other teams. In Houston, he was clearly the number one option. And he was that number one option for years. And they had a couple attempts to possibly make a finals run. You know, they were very close one year against the Golden State Warriors, but they couldn't seal the deal. And that was despite the fact that James was the preeminent player for that team. They bring Chris Paul into the fold. They bring Russell Westbrook into the fold in different years during his tenure in Houston. It never manifested in a finals appearance. And then he left in his own accord in pretty dramatic fashion. That last year he was with Houston. Didn't go well. And it was pretty petty when he showed up pretty much 15 to 20 pounds overweight before getting shipped off to Brooklyn. And then in Brooklyn, I have to be honest, he just wasn't that good of a teammate. He was a good teammate to Kyrie Irving. He was a good teammate to Kevin Durant. And I think the amount of games that they actually played together with all three of them was less than 15 games throughout the year and a half that they were actually playing in Brooklyn. So now that he's in Philly, now James is very excited about going to Philly. This has kind of been his, I guess, his main destination that he's been looking at really when the Houston tenure was coming to a close, but he went to Brooklyn first. So I think he's definitely excited about the opportunity that being with the 76ers is going to present. But the interesting dynamic that's going to take place is whether or not that Joel Embiid and James Harden are going to mesh well together moving forward. Because when I look at it, Joel is primarily a ball dominant player who's going to put up the majority of the shots in the starting five. Well, now you add James into the mix. 
James is going to get his touches. James is probably going to get 15, 20 shots potentially. And I don't know how necessarily that's going to work with Joel because Joel is an MVP candidate at this point, And he might take a back seat in that MVP race just because he has to account for James's impact and role with the 76ers for the rest of the season. Now, if James can play a facilitator type role that he's been able to do in the past for Philly for the rest of the season, I think he could work out very well. But if he becomes that ball dominant player where he's putting up 20, 25 shots a game, I think it's going to work against Philly. And I think they're going to struggle mightily. So my projection for this whole James Harden experiment in Philly is there's a lot of recency bias attached to what I believe. But to be quite honest with you, I think James is going to play well at first, but I think there's going to be some drama stirred up some point later this season or during the off season. And I think it's going to get ugly to the point where James is going to find a situation where he wants to go to a different team because he's going to be the center of attention. He's going to bring a lot of drama into Philly. And then I think it's going to be a bad situation moving forward for him where he's going to look for a new team. Unfortunately, you know, you have a player of this caliber. He's a great player. I don't think anybody can deny that, but he's always known for drama. And I think wherever he goes, that drama is going to follow. And I think, unfortunately, the ending result for James and Philly is going to be what took place in Houston and in Brooklyn. That's just how I see it. And the part that makes me laugh is, yes, you're getting a great potential top 10 player on the court. What you're getting off the court is such a massive distraction. Like for the news and and, and Shams and all of these other reporters to, to be saying, James was still going out and doing the, the things he wanted to do, the strip club, the partying, the drinking, whatever. The late nights, coming to practice tired, not participating. You're still getting that James Harden too. And I think people are really losing focus there because for God's sakes, Kyle, we send it to each other at the same time. The Philadelphia local strip club is excited as shit for James Harden to be in Philadelphia. Yep. Whether that was a troll or a joke or was dead serious, you know damn well he is going to continue to live his lifestyle. And that is going to be a distraction with the team, off the court, and on the court. What are you going to do when it's come playoff time and this man's at a strip club till 5, 6 in the morning and you got practice at 8, 9 in the morning, 10 in the morning, and he's sluggish, he's slow, he's hungover? A lot of NBA players are doing it. I get it. But the fact that people are consistently reporting that being an issue in his last two organizations in Houston and obviously sitting there in Brooklyn, what you think? Phillies are not going to open the flo- or roll out the red carpet and say, yo, you're going to go to the best strip club for free, bro. You think he's not going to toss up hundreds of thousands of dollars at these girls at money or at, at food and drinks? James Harden off the court is more of a distraction than what James Harden is going to be able to put on the court. And I guarantee you, Doc Rivers' old-fashioned coaching style is not going to tolerate it. And Joel Embiid and James are going to come to blows, not physically, but they're going to have some verbal altercations on the court because you literally have seen him argue with every single teammate he has asked to go, or excuse me, has asked to come to his team. And now that he's asked to go to Philadelphia – that personality with Ben Sim- with Ben Simmons, I have been messing up all night tonight. That personality with Joel Embiid and James Harden is going to come to is going to come to a big boiling point at one point. Man, I'm just glad that the NBA doesn't have a team in Las Vegas because God forbid if they did, I don't think James, James would be would a, James. James would literally there all day. I mean, literally after practice club, after game club, like, it, bro, I, he would just be so dedicated to do that, and it's. It's kind of weird because I know NBA players, like, I know some of them definitely like the club life. There's no doubt about it where, you know, I mean, they can go to a club and probably spend ten, twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 like it's nothing. I mean, hell, I mean, they make my salary basically. In what And a game. Like, yeah, basically. You know, basically what I make in a year. So I definitely think that by and large, you know, James is going to have to come to some sort of, I don't want to say agreement. But he's going to have to acknowledge that the style and the manner that he's been communicating with his teammates the last couple of years, whether it was in Houston, whether it was in Brooklyn, it hasn't worked in the long term. 
So I think James is going to come to a, a point where it's like, look, I got to be a player and I got to be a teammate that's going to help the team move forward instead of take the team backwards. And that is kind of the situation that with James, I don't know if he's capable of that. Don't get me wrong. James is a great player. James is one of the best scorers in the game. But personality-wise, he's a toxic teammate. And, you know, don't get me wrong. The guy could score at will. The guy could drop 30, 35 points like it's nothing. But you get some type of player like that where their ego is, like, literally the size of Texas. And once the chirping starts, you know, things could get chippy pretty quick. Didn't last long in Brooklyn. It was only a year and a half. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to, you know, crash and burn in Philly immediately. But I think as time progresses, I think there's going to be some drama stirred up. And I think that James is going to be the point of reference. Because I just don't see James staying there long term. I really don't. I think he nope. might stay there two years max and that's it. So overall, hopefully it works out well for them. But, dude, by and large, I don't think it's going to work. You know, if it, it, I don't even know if they're going to get all the way to the finals. We'll see. But, I don't know. This just has, it just has bad writing on the wall the way that I see it. So, with that said, we're going to transition into some of our Eastern and Western Conference predictions. So, what I mean by that is, is that Kevin and I are going to go through each conference and we're going to, select a team from each conference that we think is going to not only have a great finish to the regular season, but this is a team that could potentially propel all the way to a finals appearance when it's all said and done in June. So we'll start with the Eastern Conference first, and then we'll go to the Western Conference. So in the Eastern Conference right now, we'll just go over the top five teams as it's currently stated. So the number five spot, we have the Cleveland Cavaliers. Number four spot, we had the Bucks. Number three, we have the 76ers. And number two, we have the Heat. And then at number one, we have the Chicago Bulls. So really, when you look at the Eastern Conference with those top five teams, they're only separated by three and a half games from the first seed to the fifth seed. So there's going to be a lot of shifting that's going to take place as far as seeding goes by the time the end of the regular season hits in, I believe, April. So, you know, just based off of the current situation that we have, these standings could look entirely different by the time that we hit April going into the playoff stretch. Now, Kevin, to kick this one to you, with the way the Eastern Conference is set up as far as the standing goes at this current moment in time, who do you think is a team in the top five that could not only have a great playoff run, but that could potentially get to the finals this season? I got to be honest, it's the team in which we both said was going to shock a lot of people, and that is the Chicago Bulls. DeMar DeRozan tonight has hit his eighth consecutive 35-point game, which is two away from Michael Jordan's all-time record as a Bull. Obviously, you have the stellar play of Zach Levine, and then you go and you add another dominant veteran like a DeMar DeRozan. You go and make an acquisition with Alonzo Ball and Alex Caruso and draft a Kobe White, and then, of course, you make the trade for Vucevic. You have yourself a relatively deep, consistent, and high-scoring offense that is also playing at a very, very good defensive level. They're doing it in all phases. They're finding ways to win games. DeMar DeRozan is like the fourth quarter god in Chicago right now. And then, of course, they're not even healthy right now. That's the crazy part. Lonzo and Caruso have been out for quite some time. So you're really looking at this and they're saying, wow, they're doing this without two of their best players and two of their arguably best defenders. DeMar DeRozan's doing this in his 30s. Like, Vucevic is finding his his rhythm again like he did in Orlando. Kobe White is 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 fighting for a six man of the year award. I just it's really hard to combat them when you look at other teams and say, well, what is it that those teams have that Chicago doesn't? Milwaukee's got Giannis and he does a lot of different things, but in terms of clutch performance, he's leading or if not in the top NBA scoring just like Giannis. He's defending very well, and he's contributing on the offensive side of the ball as well. You got Chris Middleton, a good shooter. 
Zach Levine's a good shooter. You have Drew Holiday, a good defender. When Lonzo Ball gets back, he's actually having a career year from be- a career year from behind the arc at forty two percent. So he's a shooter, and we all know Lonzo Ball can defend and rebound. So I'm not trying to make a comparison and say that they're equal, but I'm saying that each team has something of their own that the other does not, or that is comparable to the other. And I really think that with the veteran leadership of DeMar DeRozan and, of course, Lonzo Ball and Alex Caruso, I really think this team is poised to make not just a significant playoff push, but they 100% can achieve the NBA Finals. Yeah, Kevin, I mean, I fully understand where you're going with the Chicago Bulls in this case. I'm going to go against the grain, though, on this one a little bit. I'm going to go with the Milwaukee Bucks. I think the Bucks are going to get back-to-back finals appearances, and here's why. When I look at the Bucks from a standpoint this year, from a overall standpoint, the Bucks have been very consistent this year. They've largely held themselves in the top four seeds throughout the entire year. And once again, Giannis is playing at a superstar level. I mean, we were just going over a segment about who's at the top of the MVP race right now. And Giannis is without a doubt in the top three compared to Nikola Jokic and Joel Embiid. You have to add Giannis in there because the guy is almost averaging 30 points a game. The guy is just an absolute monster down low, and he is known to facilitate a little bit here and there in stretches. So you tie that in with the role players that they have at their disposal. Chris Middleton, once again, very consistent jump shooter. He was huge for them in specific games in their playoff run last year when they won the finals. And once again, He's just a model of consistency. He's a great number two option that Milwaukee has. And he's lived up to that expectation of that number two role extremely well. You got Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday, granted, he can be hit or miss offensively. But you have to admire what he's able to bring on the defensive front. Because I'm not saying that he's like a lockdown defensive player. But you have to respect the fact that when he's in that zone, he can literally change an entire complexion of a game if he's making a steal or two when it matters the most. We saw that in the finals last year, multiple times when he was able to come up with some big plays on the defensive side of the ball that really helped Milwaukee win that title last year. And then when you really look at the rest of the Bucks as a whole, you know, the Bucks are getting great contributions from their bench as well, or just role players by and large. You can look at guys like Bobby Portis. Bobby Portis has always been somebody that has just been there when they need it the most to come off the bench and provide a spark. Because really, to me, Bobby Portis is like that energizer bunny for that Bucks team. You know, Giannis goes out there and dominates. He's their superstar. But Bobby, he provides a great role for that team for just providing a spark, really getting the crowd into it. And he can make some big plays down the stretch moving forward. And I also like the fact that they have Serge Ibaka on their bench. Granted, Serge Ibaka has always been known as a great defensive presence in his time with the Oklahoma City Thunder, with the Toronto Raptors for a little bit. Now he's with the Bucks. He's coming off their bench, typically playing about 20, 25 minutes a game. You have to respect what he's able to present down low in the paint because he can grab boards. He's a decent jump shooter. And he's known to get a couple blocks here and there. So, you know, I'm just going over a couple of those role players. And I think when you look at this team as a whole, they have the pieces to not only make a great playoff run this year. I think they have all of the pieces to possibly get to a finals appearance once again. Now, I will say that the Eastern Conference is more competitive recently than it has been when LeBron James pretty much owned that conference from 2010 to about 2018. So there is a lot more parity when you look at, I guess, the power structure of the Eastern Conference. The Bulls are having a great year, like you mentioned. The Heat are having a great year as well. But when I look at the Bulls, the Bulls have been there. The Bulls know how to get to that top of the mountain in the NBA. When you look at the Heat, when you look at the Bulls, They're having a great year, but we don't know how that's going to translate into playoff success. I'm going to side with a little bit of history on this one. I'm going to go with the Bucs just because 
I think that history is going to do them well when they get into a playoff situation in April, May, and potentially June. That's just how I see it, but I got the Bucks in this one. All right, so moving on into our next conference, obviously we are going into the Western Conference. So we are making our prediction on who we believe could be poised to make a significant run in not only the Western Conference playoffs, but who is going to be able to make a run at the finals. So Kyle, who do you have coming out of the Western Conference and why? Kevin, this is a tricky one for me just because there are so many good teams in the Western Conference. But I'm going to pick the Golden State Warriors, and here's why. When I look at Golden State, are they the best team in the Western Conference right now? No. You'd have to give that to the Phoenix Suns. The Phoenix Suns have a 49-10 and 10 record. The Warriors have a 42-17 and 17 record. Obviously, you'd have to give the advantage to the Suns during the regular season. Now, the one thing that I like about Golden State over Phoenix is that this year in particular, Golden State is healthy. When you look at Phoenix currently, Phoenix is dealing with some injuries, specifically Chris Paul, who broke his thumb during the All-Star week in Cleveland and is going to be out six to eight weeks. And I do think that's going to have a detrimental impact for the Suns in their near-term future. I think when I look at Golden State here, I think Golden State has an opportunity to take advantage of that. So currently, as it stands right now, Golden State is seven games behind the Suns. Now, I don't know if the Suns are going to falter that much where the Warriors are going to catch up to them and the Warriors hit the number one seed. But if they do, I think the Suns are, they may lose some confidence going into the playoffs if they happen to lose that number one seed to the Golden State Warriors. And when you look at Golden State as a whole, Golden State is relatively healthy. Golden State has Klay Thompson back in the fold. Not only that, you got Steph, who's absolutely lighting it up this year. You've had Jordan Poole, who has been phenomenal in stretches, and he's been able to show that when the moment shines brightest on him, he could be able to provide a huge spark for Golden State when his name is called upon. And not only that, I like some of the role players that they have at their disposal. I think Kavon Looney has done a solid job down low for the Warriors this season. Granted, I wouldn't say he's like going out there and playing like Nikola Jokic or playing like Joel Embiid, but for the purpose that he serves for Golden State, I think it works well for them. And I think he's having a relatively good year as well. I also like Kaminga. Kaminga is relatively young, but in short and intermediate spurts when he gets burn on the court he's been able to provide a pretty big spark for golden state and i look at the roster that golden state has you know look this team has been here before you know steph draymond clay they've won multiple nba titles in the past and when you look at golden state recently i wouldn't say that they are really like the top dog in the western conference anymore or at least it, there's been a shift as far as what I think they used to be just because they were the top dog for so long from 2014 to about 2018, 2019. And then when they took that step back, the year that Steph got hurt, the, the year that Clay got hurt, you could definitely tell that the Warriors were definitely, they were definitely a vulnerable team. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think this team has all the pieces to not only make a great playoff push in April and May, I think they have all of the pieces to make that same run to the finals like they did just a couple years ago. Granted, they don't have Kevin Durant at their disposal like they did when they made their last finals appearance. Granted, they did lose that one to the Toronto Raptors, but really you could tell the injuries were just the major factor in the reason why Golden State lost that finals. I don't think that's going to be the case in this one. I think they have all the pieces to make that finals push. The only thing that's going to possibly stop them, I think is Phoenix, because I really do think it's a one, two man race at this point, just because you have to respect the Suns. They made it all the way to the finals last year. Granted, they did lose to the Bucks, but I do think that Golden State can learn some of the vulnerabilities that Phoenix has from that loss that they had to the Bucks last year. I think that they could expose it in the playoffs and I could see the Warriors getting back to a finals appearance when it's all said and done when June comes around. It's a very close race, though. I really only see it as the Suns and the Warriors. I'm going to give the edge to Golden State in this one, and that's just how I see it. 
Yeah, so I mean, I'm going to go a completely different route, and I'm actually going to go with the Phoenix Suns to go back and repeat as Western Conference champions, and here's why. So it's actually funny. Kyle and I actually did the opposite for each conference. He has the Bucks going back, and I got the Suns going back, but we both have different teams in the other conference, so it's a little funny. But I think that Phoenix is more prepared than they were last year. I think Phoenix now, with a great year under their belt, with Monty Williams being a candidate, if not a leading candidate, for Coach of the Year once again, they brought back most of the same cast. You can see that Devin Booker has elevated his game to another level. Uh, Chris Paul, when he comes back, I believe he's going to make significant difference and, again, have a big impact. Last year he was hurt in the postseason and was dealing with a nagging injury with the shoulder and whatnot. I know that he said it was healed, but he did reveal that he was kind of dealing with it a little bit as games kind of progressed. There were moments where he had some, you know, some pain, some discomfort. So I feel like as the season progresses and he gets back into a rhythm as the season, uh, as the postseason kind of continues, I think that they're going to make another big run. Um, their biggest issue was being able to guard Giannis Antetokounmpo in the finals. They only had DeAndre Ayton. And when he got into foul trouble, obviously at that point they had to rely on uh, Frank Kaminsky. And obviously, uh, what's his name? He got hurt, uh, Dario Sarge. Now they have JaVel McGee, and now they have Bismack Biombo. Now, obviously, JaVel McGee ain't no crazy defender, but we know that he is a big rim presence. And then, of course, Bismack Biombo, a very physical, aggressive defender that's going to be able to withstand the strength that Giannis Antetokounmpo has. But at the same time, I just believe that Devin and Chris have elevated their game to another level to where they know how to play so well off of each other. They don't necessarily need to have the ball in each other's hands at all times. And then, of course, Cam Johnson's having a great year this year. Cameron Payne also off the bench is having a consistent year. And I just think that this is such a well-rounded, such a deep team, and, of course, a very well-coached team. It's going to be hard to believe that they're not going to go back to the finals. They're the best record in the NBA. They're freaking what? What is this? I literally have it up here. The Phoenix Suns are 40 – of course, I can't read now. The, the Suns are 49 and 10. They're 29 and 7 in conference. They're 26 and 5 at home. And then they're 23 and 5 away. They're 9 and 1 in their last 10. And I believe they just won tonight, right? Yeah, they beat the Oklahoma City Thunder. So they're on a 10 game, a 9 game win streak. Are you like, like, I get it. It's the regular season. I completely comprehend it. There's a whole nother month and a half to go of the regular season. But when you have a team this hot, this confident, rolling through, looking to get vengeance from the season before a redemption year, which is technically what this season is because they've kind of kept the band pretty much together, um, I don't see anybody in the Western Conference stopping them. But I do agree that Golden State would probably be their best competition. I don't believe that Memphis is going to have enough of experience nor enough firepower to compete in a seven-game series against a high-powered offense like the Warriors and the Suns. The Jazz are two up and down, battling their own injuries. And then, of course, you have Dallas rounding out at the number five seed. And I just don't have faith in the, in the trade acquisition that we made for Bertans and, of course, Dinwiddie. So if it's all going to be on Luka's shoulders all over again, that's another first or second round exit because you just have to double trap and make other people beat you. So I definitely got Phoenix coming out of the West, and I think that they are going to actually make a big playoff run this year. Yeah, and I mean – the thing about the Western conferences is that it's always competitive and oh. you never know what's going to happen when it comes to the playoffs. You know, who would have thought that, you know, the Suns would have gone all the way to the finals last year and damn near win it. And that was despite the fact that that was the first year that they had Chris Paul in the lineup with Devin Booker and DeAndre. Ayton. So, you know, for me, I do think that that injury will, will play a little bit of a factor for the Suns moving forward. Now, if they fall apart and they lose that number one seed, because currently they're down seven games, you know, they're up seven games over the Warriors. That's a pretty big margin to lose. Now, but the Suns really do falter. I think they'll lose confidence, bro. I, I, I really do, because if you do not finish the season well, going into the playoffs, that that's... It's tough to get it back. Now, I do think that Chris, once he gets back into the fold, I think that will kind of reset them. And I think, you know, it'll be smooth sailing from there. But, dude, I'm not 100% sure. Because six to eight weeks is a while. So you're looking at what? It's it's the end of February. You figure Basically six March. Weeks. So he's going to be out all of March. He's probably going to be out the first two weeks in April. 
depending, so, you know, on, you know, any recovery sooner or whatever have you, but yeah. You know, the latest, you know, we'll probably see him back is late April. I don't think he's going to give, I don't think he's going to be held out that long to where he's going to be. Me out either. I don't, I don't see that. I, I think he'd be back in April, but I think Golden State has all the pieces to make that finals run again. I really do. Now, it's just whether or not that they can stay healthy. That's, that's really the main point, is if they could stay healthy, I think they have a great shot to get back to the finals. But it, to me, it's a two-man race at this point. It really is. It's Golden State and Phoenix. I don't really see it any other way. No, I mean, it, it's going to be a good battle. I mean, the Western Conference is in absolute shambles this year just because of how many injuries are plaguing mega superstars. I mean, for God's sakes, the Timberwolves are seventh in the goddamn Western Conference, and that's something I haven't said in God knows how long. So, yeah, you know, it's crazy. You know, with So we will see as the season plays out. I know that I made this the statement earlier in another segment or earlier in the episode where I think that Phoenix will falter a little bit. But regardless, I think that they still have enough pieces. I think that the little bit of adversity at the end of the season is going to do them well to realize we got to step it up if we want to achieve this goal. And with a lot of veterans on that team, the, the way that they have it and the coach that Monty Williams is, that might bode them a, a, a little bit, a little bit well. You know, I think that that's going to give them some significant, you know, a little fire under their ass, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's going to remind them, hey, we can lose this just as quickly as we got here. So let's let's remember. But again, um, we got a little bit of ways to go before the playoffs. But that's who Kyle and I have going all the way for the end of the season. Yeah, and uh, Kevin, I think we've, um, I think we've not done all of our topics. Uh, unless you have really anything else to add. I- I'm I'm pretty much good to wrap this up. Yeah, I mean, I I am too. I mean, I'm trying to save my partner here, trying to wrap this up before he actually sneezes himself to death. But guys, as always, thank you so much for the support. We are just four subs away from 400. We are making moves on social media platforms to gain a following and some traction in different places. But as always, it would not be anywhere as good as it is now without you. So, you know, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, Please do so on YouTube, follow the podcast on Spotify, Apple, and of course, Anchor. We have just so many different outlets here, and we have an incredible, incredible support system. So again, thank you so much. And uh, Kyle, I don't want to speak for you, but if that's everything, we'll see them later. I'll say one, I'll say one thing before we wrap it up, <laughs> just because I, I, I got a little bit left in me. So, you know, like Kevin said, though, you know, we definitely appreciate you guys uh, supporting the podcast in the way that you have, whether it's us you know, hearing us on the audio platforms like Spotify or Apple Podcasts or watching our YouTube content. You know, if you guys like our content on YouTube, definitely hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, you know, any sort of support that we can give for the channel. Kevin, I definitely appreciate that. I know I sound like a, I know I sound like a broken record when I say that, but I genuinely do appreciate, and I'm pretty sure I can speak for Kev on that too, just the support that we get from all aspects of our podcast. And, um, you know, hopefully that support continues moving on into the future. Um, hopefully next week I will be feeling a little bit better. Hopefully my allergies subside a little bit, but uh, we'll see. Um, you know, we're really kind of in the thick of it of the NBA season at this point. So, you know, really we're gonna gonna we're gonna kind of buckle down here. We're gonna just really focus on the NBA moving forward. Not much movement on. MLB, that's kind of a whole shit show at this point. So we'll kind of see where that goes. But I don't really expect anything significant coming out of the MLB anytime soon. But we'll always keep our ears and eyes open for that. But, you know, with that said, you guys, once again, just thank you guys for tuning in and watching or listening to the episode. And we'll see you guys next week.